Good morning, church. We're glad you're here this morning. You guys stand with us and we worship.
Zach, praise team. Listen, y'all be seated for just a moment. I uh, just want to welcome you here this morning. My name is John Yates. I'm the new generation pastor here at First Baptist Gulf Shores. And if you're new here today, uh, someone should have handed you this bulletin. So what we want you to do is take it out with us. And on the count of three, we're going to tear off this little flap right here, okay? So just grab them out, get them out. Make sure that you got a pen with you too. One, two, and three. Good job. Listen, please fill this out. Every single person in here, we want to know uh, how we can pray for you. We'd love to know that you're here today. Make sure we have your correct address. Anything you're interested in ministry-wise, you can check boxes on there as well. Uh, and then as you leave today, as all of us leave today, those of us who are members, part of this body, believers, or guests, please um, put these into the gray boxes right outside the worship center as you leave today. And inside of your bulletin are a few things that I want to make you aware of. The first thing is... Um, you can uh, take this out. This is a Vacation Bible School registration. Um, I know we had one in there last week, but we continue to have it in there because, um, you know, our goal is to reach so many kids in this community through Vacation Bible School that um, we want to be overwhelmed with young people, with students, with, uh, with children. We want to be so overwhelmed that we need your help because we're going to be so overwhelmed with children for Vacation Bible School. So please fill this out. Place this in the boxes with, um, if you're members, with your tithes and offerings today and your welcome cards. And then um, also right outside is a table for a women's event that's happening this Saturday. So if you don't have tickets to that, please uh, read more about that in the bulletin and go to the table and uh, get tickets for that. I do want to, to mention just a couple things as well. Um, we have, uh, um, in the last few weeks, we've had some babies born here at First Baptist Gulf Shores. Um, they're probably watching online still because their babies are very, very new, uh, either just a week old or just a couple weeks old. So uh, Will and Maggie Pearson had a baby, uh, John Thomas, um, and then, of course, uh, Leah Collins and Casey Collins, her husband, um, also had a baby, Hunter Hartwell. So we want to um, give them, let's, let's do this this morning. So I'm going to look at this camera. And if we can, uh, um, let's just give them a big hand of uh, welcoming to the world their new babies. Can we do that together? I know it's, uh, it's I mean, such a monumental time for those, those young families that are part of uh, First Baptist Body Believers. We have lots of babies in this place, and we're thankful for that. But I do want to also pray for you guys, pray for... Um, uh, of course, the Harris family, whose uh, uh, um, father and husband just passed away a few short weeks ago. So we want to be praying for them. They're here this morning. Um, and then also just want to pray for you and your family. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's take this time to focus not just on ourselves, but on other people, on interceding for other people, but also on just lifting up God's holy and glorious name. So as we continue to worship right after we pray, we understand that this time is so vital to our growth spiritually of understanding who God is, who he's made us to be. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you. So grateful for your protection for us. That you send your angels to protect us, to care for us. God, that your Holy Spirit is inside of us, the lives of those who believe in you. And God, all things work together for the good because we believe, because we know we're called according to not our purpose, our family's purpose, our friend's purpose, our boss's purpose, but your purpose. Your purpose is what is on our heart, what's on our lives. 
So we're asking today that we live in that purpose. But not only we live in that purpose, but as we stand up in a few moments, we recognize that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you are the God that is the author of all good things. So we want to meet you today, meet you this morning. With our hands lifted high, we want to meet you and worship to you, for you, because you deserve it. We do pray for the Harris family. We're so thankful they're here today. Comfort them. Your Holy Spirit, just wash over them and guide them the next few days, weeks, and months. Thank you for their faithfulness. Pray that in the holy name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Hey, let's stand together. Let's continue to worship. Before we do that, just grab someone around you. Give me a handshake, fist bump, and or a big neck hug.
to share with you guys this morning, um, and it comes out of where this next song that we're going to sing comes from. This is from um, Matthew 24, 30, um, and it says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And keep worshiping. This tension growing strong It's just a sign He's getting closer He's already on Yeah, the story has been written We all know how it ends My future has an end My eyes are on the same He's coming back Yeah, He's coming back He who is to come 
God, we just thank you for this time of worship. I pray that you just be with us as we bring the word, God. We just thank you for this time. Amen. Well, it's good to see you today. I'm glad that God put you here in this place. And, you know, it's great to worship Him and to get our hearts open so that we can hear what God wants to say. Last week, we began by talking about uh, re-identifying the basics. And the first thing that we said is begin with the Bible. That's the basic. We've got to find out what God's Word has to say before we can do what it says. So that's where we start, just by beginning with the Bible. Today we're going to talk about aspiring to advance. Now we want to take some steps. We want to become more of what God wants us to be. I want us to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 7. And we just sang about it a few moments ago. And it talks about, you know, the winds that came, the, the floods that rose. Well, Jesus was coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he had done a lot of teaching. Uh, and, of course, he started off with what we call the Beatitudes. And he laid out all the things that we're supposed to be. And he comes to the place where he tells people not to worry, but to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything will be added unto them. And he talks about prayer. He talks about 
you know, keep on asking, you'll receive. Keep on seeking, you'll find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open to you. Now he comes down to the concluding remarks. He's done all this teaching. And then he says in Matthew 7, 24 and following, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the wind blew, and it beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So Jesus is talking here. It's kind of interesting. The interesting part of the story that most people miss is that both houses experienced the rainstorm. Both houses had the floods rise. Both houses had the wind blow. One of those houses fell, and one of them didn't. The one that didn't fall was the one that was built on the rock, and the rock is Jesus. So what we've got to do is we've got to say, okay, Lord, how do I build my house on the rock? And, and he says it here. It, it's built on the rock. When we get to the place where we have application, it takes application. Now, that may be the place where we wind up, but it's the place that keeps your life on the rock. Notice what Jesus says. The one who hears and does. It's not just a matter of hearing what God's Word has to say. It's putting into practice what God's Word has to say. So what we want to do is we want to put into practice what God has to say through His Word. So you have application, which is the ultimate goal. That we're taking these principles that we're learning and that we're teaching week after week after week in Bible study and worship, and we're applying those to our lives. That's the goal. Now, how do you get to the goal? Well, one of the ways you do that is through discipleship. That is one means to the goal. And you see, discipleship is not just about learning, but it's about following. When you're involved in discipleship, you're catching it. James Kennedy used to say, evangelism is better caught than taught. Well, discipleship is something that you catch. It's not something that you just teach. But a lot of materials that we look at and we see as discipleship materials, they're inducted Bible studies. Nobody walks with anybody. When it's over with, they get a certificate, they've done the course, and they move on to the next course. But you see, that's not Jesus' goal. Jesus' goal is that when you're discipled, you catch it, and then you can go on and teach it. And that scares a lot of people. Because their their thing is, well, I want to learn, but I don't want to teach. <laughs> How are you going to make disciples if you're not willing to pass on what you've learned? That's one of the things Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. That's how it keeps going. You take it and you entrust it to somebody in such a way that they can entrust it to somebody else and it just keeps going and it goes and it goes and it goes. So God's goal for us is to apply his word, but in order to apply it, we've got to grow as disciples. We've got to become the disciples that he wants us to be. And then you have to put in their vision. Vision. Simply put, aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You get a vision for what God wants you to do. And you see what vision does? When you get a vision, it gives you hope and it gives you life. And that's how God wants to work through us. He wants us to have that hope. In fact, he tells us that's part of the spiritual armor. Put on the helmet of the hope of our salvation. 
And we, when we have a vision, we get that hope and we get that life. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, people perish. Where there's no vision, people perish. Now, another translation says, where there's no revelation, which is vision, by the way, people cast off restraint. In other words, if, they, if people don't have a vision for what they need to do, guess what? They're liable to do anything. Can you identify with that in the world that we're living in today? People don't have a vision of doing anything positive, so what they're doing, they're just left to their own devices. And we see a world just crumbling in front of us because of that. Well, the church doesn't need to crumble in front of us. The church needs to make sure that we have a vision, corporately, but also individually. I was thinking about years ago, if you take a uh, stick of dynamite and you unwrap it and you, you light it, you know what you get? You get a big fizz. You, if you take a river and you knock its banks out, you know what you get? A swamp. You see, the, the wrapping on the, the gunpowder is what gives dynamite its strength. The banks to the river are what give the river its power. Your vision is like that wrapping on gunpowder and it's called dynamite, or your, your vision is like those banks of the river that puts you in a direction to go where God can use you and where he can work through your life. So we have application, we have discipleship, we have vision, but we also need a positive attitude. We need a positive attitude. You see, people who live in the negative Seldom go anywhere. One of the things that, that I often do when I'm preaching about the 12 people that went into the promised land, and they went to spy out the promised land. And there were 10 people who came back and said, we can't do this. Negative individuals, bad attitudes. We just can't do this. Do y'all remember those 10? Yeah. What are their names? Just name one of them. You see, we don't remember people who say we can't. But there were two individuals who came back and said, we can do this. With God's help, we can take the land. What were their names? All over the room, people are saying Joshua and Caleb. You see, nobody remembers people who say we can't. They remember those who say, we can, we can get this done. Now, the sad thing about that story is that Joshua and Caleb had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years before they got to go into the promised land. The other 10 didn't get to go at all. But just because the other 10 said, we can't do this, even they got punished for 40 years. When our attitude is what it needs to be, we believe God can do anything. Paul says it this way, I can do all things through Christ and that's what gives me strength. I, I can do it through Jesus. That's the attitude we have to have. And it takes us to a vision, causes us to become the disciples God wants us to be and ultimately, we're applying those principles in our spiritual lives and the kingdom grows. Well, there are tough times when you're doing what God wants you to do. I don't know whether you guys have bumped up in, in, into any of those, but if you haven't, you will. But there are tough times that come. And what often happens is that people get to a place where they think, you know, what's the use? I think I'm just going to quit. I might as well give up. Well, one of the principles of advancing is never giving up. Never giving up. 
You just predetermined in your mind that you're never going to give up. I heard something years ago, caught my attention and is just burned in my memory. And it's simply this. A failure is not one who fails. A failure is one who gives up or quits. You see, just because we fail at something doesn't make us failures. But if we give up, if we quit, then we're failures. A couple of weeks ago, well, actually for several months, I've been trying to get in touch with uh, my main translator when I would go into Ukraine. And uh, her name is, is Nadia, and she's married to Pastor Vitaly. And uh, they're from Kharkov, U- Ukraine. And I've had zero success and I didn't know whether something had happened to him. Uh, I didn't know whether uh, she may have changed her email address. Uh, but a week ago Friday, I did a memorial in Montgomery, and I, I met one of the nurses that went into Ukraine with us several times. And she had just been in communication with Nadia, and I said, look, make sure she gets in touch with me. Well, she did this week. And, uh, and right now, they're in the United States. They have... They have three daughters who are married, and all three of them live in the United States. They've been here for several years. Uh, but Nadia and Vitaly are in the United States right now, and, and, uh, and she was just kind of telling me that in May, uh, they're going back to Kharkov. They're going back to Ukraine in May. You know, last week they bombed Kharkov, and many of the bombs fell right where their apartment complex is. And, and Vitaly and the other people that own the apartments in that building literally built that building with their own hands. But their attitude is not, well, we're just going to stay in the States. You know, we'll, we'll live with our kids or we'll get a job here. Or, and and, and she, she has a job with a tech company teaching English. That's what she's done for years. But right now, uh, I doubt if that job even exists. But they didn't say that. They said, we're going back in May. And I asked the question, I said, how can we help? And she said, one of the things that we've been doing, Lawrence, is that we've been ministering to people, especially elder, elderly people, who have no food, they have nothing. And, uh, and she said, our church has, you know, people have been donating to that, and we've been taking uh, the food, and, and we've been ministering to people. And she said, but what it's led to is that a number of people have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of our ministry. And she said, in fact, when we get back in May, we need to have a baptismal service, but we don't have a baptistry. And she said, we've located several possibilities. She said, the most expensive of which is $1,300. Sometime in the next day or two, I will let her know that that $1,300 is taken care of. That's something that we can do. And even after the first service this morning, I had people coming up saying, I want to give to that. I want to contribute to that. I want to be a part of that. But you know what the amazing part of their life is that they never give up. Vitaly's story is that his dad and four brothers with their mother were taken out of their home during the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, and the Russians took his grandfather. And of course, when the records were unsealed just a few years ago, they found out that he was killed shortly after they took him out of the home. But they took his grandmother and those five young boys. One of them was actually a baby out of that home and they turned them out into the snow in the middle of the night and here's what those russian soldiers said we will wipe christianity out of ukraine well that grandmother and those five boys survived one of them vitaly's dad and all five of them became baptist preachers Now, one of the grandsons is a Baptist preacher, and maybe even others are Baptist preachers. But I thought, in all those soldiers that took them out of the home, they're all dead. 
and Christianity is alive and well in Ukraine. As bad as their conditions are right now, what's, called, what's happening is that what the Russians are doing in Ukraine is causing people to come to Christ in huge numbers. Greater numbers than I think they've ever seen. And that's what's happening at Christmas Church in Kharkov right now. That lives are being changed, that people are being saved, that they're coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through a difficult, difficult situation. They don't ever give up. And you see, that's a part of advancing in the kingdom. You predetermine in your mind, I will never give up. No matter what happens, no matter what difficulty I go through, no matter how tough times become, I'm not going to give up. And the reason that Nadia and Vitaly are heading back to Ukraine in May is because they predetermined that a long time ago. We will never give up. Boy, it would be so easy for them just to stay in the States, but that's not where their mission is. It's not where their ministry is. But let me just give you a word of encouragement. Don't always do what's easy. If you really want to experience the glory of a holy God, be willing to step out and risk it for Jesus. Why do we do that? Well, Christ. He's our example. <laughs> he risked it all. It put him on the cross, but he came up out of the grave. And our salvation is because Jesus was willing to risk everything. That's why we do what we do. It's why the church is here today. We're not here to be comfortable. We're here to grow and to go and to risk. When we do that, God does great work. When we do everything we can to try to protect ourselves from the problems, the work is not done, the kingdom doesn't grow, and our lives don't advance as simple as that but you got to understand where it all starts everything begins with having eternal life in Jesus it's where it all starts knowing that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that gives you eternal life I'm sure there are many people in the room that did what I did last night. I mean, we just watched the skies of Israel as the drones were coming in, as the missiles were being fired. And many of us were just praying, God, Israel needs your protection right now. And it is amazing how ineffective Iran was. And I found out this morning, I don't know whether you've heard this report or not, they didn't even use the Iron Dome, and they didn't use the Sling of David. But you know what did happen last night? By God's grace, <laughs> America finally scrambled some jets and got in the air and took down some drones. My goodness. I thought we were going to sit on the sideline until it was too late. But you see... There are a lot of people that could have lost their lives in Israel last night. And many of those individuals don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There are a lot of Jews in Israel, but a lot of Jews that are not completed Jews. But there are also a lot of completed Jews in Israel. And I was just thinking as, as I saw the drones and the missiles being taken out, And what, what's going to happen if people lose their lives and they don't have a relationship with Jesus? Same thing happens in America that happens in Israel. If you lose your life and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to enter a Christless eternity. And let me tell you, as tough as it is in the world right now, the only thing that's keeping this world from being absolutely exploding is the Holy Spirit.
period. If it were not for him, this thing would completely fall apart tomorrow. He's holding it all together. Imagine going into an eternity where he doesn't exist. That's what you're going to experience. So eternal life, that's the first step. And we have to take the first step to get to any of the other steps. To even follow Christ as our example. To come to a place where we say, I'm not going to give up. To have an attitude that says, I want to do what God wants me to do. And then we get a vision to do that. We're discipled, we begin to grow, and then we apply those things. It all begins with eternal life. It all begins with salvation. Without salvation, none of those other things happen. And so there are three important things Paul says in Romans 10, 9, and 10. He says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. First important thing is confess that Jesus is Lord. You just have to confess he's Lord, that he's in charge. You've got to believe that he has all the power, all the authority. He can allow anything. He can stop anything. Jesus is Lord. But you have to also believe that his father raised him from the dead. You know, we just celebrated Resurrection Day a couple of weeks ago. But do you realize that there are churches that don't even believe in the resurrection? And there are a lot of churches that don't believe in the virgin birth. Listen, our faith hinges on those two important facts. That Jesus was born of a virgin, perfect in every way and never sinned, and that he died on a cruel cross and rose from the grave. He's ascended to the Father and he will come back. You have to believe that God raised him from the dead. And then you have to accept the forgiveness that he gave on the cross and invite him in your life. You see, on the cross, Jesus looks out at humanity and he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He offered that forgiveness. But we've got to accept it. You know, there are a lot of people in this world, in fact, the majority of the world, that have not accepted that. They don't receive and accept Jesus' forgiveness. And they've not invited him into their lives. I talk to people from time to time and and I ask them the questions that help me to discover whether or not they have eternal life. And here's what people will say to me from time to time. They'll say, you know, I've always been a Christian. You know what my response is? No, you haven't. Nobody's always been a Christian. You see, all of us have to come to a place where we understand that we have done things wrong. We have to accept the forgiveness that Jesus offered, and we have to invite him to come into our lives. All of us have to do that at some point. I've had people say, well, you know, my parents uh, baptized me as a baby. Well, that was your parents' dedication. That has nothing to do with your salvation. I've had people that, that have said, well, uh, you know, because I go to church, I'm going to be okay. That has to do with your spiritual growth. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It may cause you to hear about Jesus and to receive him into your life, but coming to church isn't going to save you either. So we have to confess Jesus is Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead, accept his forgiveness and invite him into our lives. And if we do that, then Jesus becomes our example. Then we accept the principle that we are not going to give up no matter what. Our attitude is a positive attitude 
that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We get a vision for what he wants us to do individually, and even what he wants us to do corporately as a church. And then we grow toward that vision by following him as disciples and applying what we have learned to our lives. In your bulletin today is a, a form about Vacation Bible School. And a lot of people looked at that and said, oh, that was in the bulletin last week. Yeah, I saw that last week. Yeah, but you didn't fill it out. I mean, a few people did. In fact, we were able to, we, we don't need anybody to work with registration. We don't we need anybody to work with uh, physical education time, and we don't need anybody to work with snacks. But you know what? We still need some teachers, and we need some facilitators. You know what that's called? Application. You know what I've learned? Information without application leads to frustration. This morning in this message, I have given you several things that you can do to apply the principles that we've talked about. Number one, I told you that you need to be praying for Israel. The Bible says be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. If you didn't know that, you now know it. So you ought to be doing it. Number two, you have an opportunity to be praying for Ukraine and for what's happening there. And you have an opportunity, if you want to, to even be a part of helping them buy a baptistry or providing meals in Ukraine. You can do that. And number three, you've been given an opportunity to work and see a lot of children coming, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is, it's remarkable how many people found Jesus at Vacation Bible School? And we get to be a part of that in just a couple of weeks. Well, more than a couple, but just a few weeks. A lot of people. So there are things that we need to do. But if all we're doing is gathering information, you're going to be frustrated. If you put application with the information... You're going to be excited about what God does with your life in his church and in the kingdom. Lord, we want you to work, to move, to live, to have your being in us. Father, I pray that you would guide us to advance our Christian walk knowing that we have a relationship with you, but ultimately applying what we've learned. Jesus, you told us that when we hear what you've told us to do and do it, we're building our lives on you, the rock. And when we don't, it's like building our lives in sinking sand. Guide us as believers to step up our application for your glory and for the sake of the gospel. Lord Jesus, I also pray this morning for those who don't know that if they were to die today, they would spend an eternity with you in heaven. I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would move and that people in this room and online would pray right now and say, Father, I know I've been doing it my way. I know that's sin. And Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. I want to be a Christian. And I want to learn what it means to follow you. Jesus, thank you for saving me. 
Amen. This morning, if you invited Jesus to come into your life, please take that welcome card and make sure your information's on the front. And on the back, there's a place where you can check and say, you know, today I invited Jesus in my life. If you want to be a part of this church, you can check that. But also, you can go to Discovery this morning at 1045, right after this service ends, Discovery is going to be in the crafts room. Just go all the way down the hall, the long hallway, and before you go out the back door, take a right. And the craft, crafts room is down that hallway. But if you want more information, let us know. If there's another decision, let us know that. That's what that welcome card is for. So please fill those out. Place them in those gray boxes on the walls outside the worship center and give us an opportunity to follow up with you. Most of our members either give online or uh, they put their tithes and offerings in the boxes. And of course, we tell the guests the offering we want from you is that welcome card because it's our responsibility to support this ministry financially. It's not your job. But every week, We come before the Lord because he is giving us so much. The people resources, the prayer resources, the service resources, the financial resources, he's done so much. And we're not going to leave God out because it's all because of him. Tim Aldridge, one of our deacons, is going to lead this offertory prayer time. Tim, as you pray, we're going to agree. beautiful weather you've gave us uh just thank for this church thank for the leadership here lord just bless them for protection and blanket over them lord just uh bless the tithes and offerings that are give back to you lord so uh we can use in needy people and needy areas and all over the world lord to uh help folks that are in need and for food and clothing and just help them Thanks for the blessings you give us in the U.S., no matter what it is, that we can give back to you. In Christ's name, amen. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being in this place today. Sure. 